Hi guys, very good afternoon. So I'm in my final year this semester, um, just two months to graduation, finally. And I just thought it's a very timely moment to just take a step back and look back at my education. Because I think I've gone a very conventional path, sorry, unconventional path, where I took two years out of school to go to Silicon Valley and I co-founded a company over there. It's called Play Moolah. And we're basically you know, teaching kids and parents about financial literacy. But what I realized coming back was that bridging the real world and school at the same time, there are a few key insights that really changed the way I treat my education. And I just thought I'll share them with you. The first insight I got was the existence of what I call divergent problems. Because what we're used to in school is always providing answers and solutions and, and to problems that have one right answer. And these problems are called convergent problems, where the more people work on it, the more they converge to a common answer. And a very good example of this is the problem of human flight. For decades and decades, people worked on how do you bring people up in the air? And this has converged into commercial aeroplanes that we now see. That is accepted design and people just build and refine on it continuously. But if you realize that all the interesting problems in this world that I find are actually divergent problems, that there are no correct solutions to that one problem. And the more people work on it with intelligence and with knowledge, the more the solutions actually contradict one another. And that to me was a key thing. Because when I started working on financial literacy in America, it was a big interesting problem that I wanted to solve. And we spoke to everyone we could, you know, we could meet in the industry. And what we realized was that the current solutions out there were all focusing on the knowledge and curriculum when you know that financial savviness is all about the action and not the knowledge. And that brought us to play Moolah. But it was upon working on all these divergent problems that I realized I was very humbled by the new abilities that I needed to have to solve a problem like that. It was less about providing answers, the correct answers to solutions, but about asking the right questions. It was less about you know, engineering and being, being subjected to deadlines, but it's about self-organizing and thinking with clarity and prioritizing your life. And more evidently was about how do you even define the problem for you to start working on? And when I realized that the school did not set me up for tackling all the interesting problems in the world, I decided I had to take education into my own hands. And so for the next one or two years, I decided to live in a life of immersion. And I was continuously drawn back to Silicon Valley because it was a place where individuals and companies were all on a mission. They're all on a mission to tackle divergent problems. But what they did was they did it in a very collaborative manner where people would share ideas and knowledge and networks instead of how we currently solve divergent problems, which is giving the responsibility to a few people in power. And what these people do is they create structures and mechanize the whole process so that people like you and I can work on it with a very formulaic version. But what I realized was the attraction of working it through collaboration, where people would share ideas and networks. And there were two key things about the Silicon Valley culture I would like to share with you, because <coughs> I think there are implications on, on how we lead our lives today. Instead of all what people say about um, taking risks and celebrating failure, I want to demystify what this actually means. And the first thing I found that was very crucial to me as a young person was that in Silicon Valley, young people are respected for their ideas, the quality of I the ideas, and not by age and experience. But the second thing was that just by putting yourself out there and refining your idea continuously, we were put in a position where taking no risk was the biggest risk of all. And I'd like you to think about that because what do I actually mean? It's very counterintuitive sitting down here thinking about that. But what happened in that one year was that we connected with everyone and anyone who would listen to us. And people got so personally vested in our ideas and excited by it. They, they would give us introductions to anyone they knew who could potentially help us. We met, I always tell the story of how two Asian girls would go into American families to really understand the problems that are happening in homes and for them to open up their houses to trust us and even work with us towards a solution was a big thing itself. The professors at Stanford, where we were studying at, would let us do this for course credit. And when we were doing an internship at Quick, even our bosses were so supportive that they would let us work at night so we could work on these problems during the day. And it was such an ecosystem of immersion that 
taking no action or taking no risk was the biggest risk of all. And I say this as a big point because what I see in this country is the government pumping all the money in the world into encouraging innovation and entrepreneurship. But I think until we as a people start taking genuine interest beyond monetary interest in what each other is doing, it's very hard for us to get any critical mass for any disruption or any change. And so that leads me to the third point because as young people, all of us receive a lot of advice. And I realized how discerning it was to decide what advice to follow and what not to. And I say this because I've been told a lot of things that now I find, and now I wonder whether they even knew what they were doing because the world is changing. And to quote Einstein, problems cannot be solved at the same level they are created. And we need young people to start working on all these interesting problems from a very young age. So a few things that I was told when I was uh, younger, that you need to study very hard and then earn a lot of money and then give back. But after a while, I was thinking, why are these three things contentious functions? Why couldn't all of them be done at the same time? And in what we are doing, you know, I think all companies should be learning organizations that tackle problems in society, that give back in a certain way. And earning revenue is just an outcome of demand for your solution. The second thing that we are continuously trying to challenge is the idea of philanthropy and charity. Because right from the beginning, we wanted a way for children to be able to allocate a little bit of their allowance to charity. But we saw so much more potential in just anonymous giving and anonymous receiving. Could we actually link up two kids from different parts of the world and let them connect in friendship and cultural exchange? And could one kid actually fund the other kid to go to school later on? So a lot of these ideas are in very, very early pilot stage, but it was always in challenging the dogma and always going back to the principle and not the precedent that we managed to find new ways of doing things. And the last thing that I recently, uh, the last recent advice I got was to spend a lot of money on PR because we have a great PR story and we need to launch big and everything. But why would we want to give our money to a PR agency? Could we come up with our own advocacy campaign? to get kids as news reporters reporting from their own countries and getting them to ask their families questions about money that they had. Where does money come from? What do banks do? Are we rich? And this has become the, the Play Moolah Kids News Network competition where we're getting kids globally to compete by submitting online videos where they take the role of financial news reporters and ask their parents questions about money that they have. And we have partnered with a lot of amazing people to get a distribution like that and to also get the press um, that we need for a cause like that. But I think in summary, I just want to end with a story. Um, and this might be an idea you want to use for your Bollywood film. <laughs> so this was told to me by a great friend and amazing uh, team member right now, Aru. When he was growing up in India, he was in a village where there were a lot of dogs roaming the streets. And it's common knowledge that if you get bitten by a dog with rabies, and the dog has only, in the later stage of rabies, when the dog has only seven days to live, it's very unlikely that you would live as well. So this got kind of convoluted into the rule of thumb that if a dog bites a child and the dog dies within seven days, the child would die as well. Common wisdom. But what happened was this rule got translated into common conventional wisdom. And so when Aru was young, he actually got bitten by a dog. There's a deep gash in, in his foot. And by this wisdom, the whole village and the whole family took the dog into the house to care for the dog for seven days to make sure that the dog would not die. And he said, the dog was getting better treatment than me. Right? And I love this story a lot because... It makes me very grateful that I was still alive. But beyond that, you know, it really causes me to challenge the dogma, sarcastically. Mm. <laughs> and that there are fatal consequences if we don't. And with that, I, I'd like to leave you with this idea worth spreading to continuously challenge the dogma and the principles in your life. Thank you.